morning, everyone. I hope you uh, had a uh, great uh, Thanksgiving. I hope you didn't eat too much turkey and uh, that you stayed awake most of the day. And I hope you didn't eat Thanksgiving turkey this morning. And maybe that's why you're a little quiet and ready to fall asleep. I hope not. Uh, I uh, am excited about us uh, starting our Christmas season next week. Excited to uh, hear uh, uh, six different uh, speakers over the next uh, three weeks. And uh, next week as we begin this whole Christmas theme of encountering Jesus, we don't want you to miss anything. Uh, We want you to uh, be able with Mary to treasure these things in your heart and to uh, ponder them. Uh, I'm going to uh, set the stage uh, next week, so to speak, for uh, all of our uh, Christmas messages, and we're going to look at at uh, Luke chapter two, where Mary, uh, we're told that Mary treasured these things and pondered them in her heart. And the word ponder means that she took every single detail, every little issue, tried to put it together to bring understanding of what uh, really the birth of Jesus Christ was uh, all about. And next week, uh, our our topic will be uh, expecting Jesus and. Uh, Steve Birch and uh, Nate Southwick will be uh, our speakers, and I know that uh, you won't want to miss that. Um, I I heard this week on a news station that um, people often miss or forget uh, about uh, gift cards. In fact, that uh, there's probably over a billion dollars a year uh, missed by people who have either forgotten that they had a certain gift card or whether, and maybe you're this way, you have a dollar or two on your, uh, some gift card and you don't use it, but it adds up to billions of dollars. Well, there's some things we can miss and get away with, others we uh, don't want to miss and we don't want to, uh, you know, lose out on something. And so when we think about Christmas, we really want to uh, focus on all of the details that, that Mary focused on so that we would come to a real uh, great appreciation of the Christmas message and be able to encounter Jesus in a new and fresh way this year. Today we're uh, back in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We kind of uh, took a little detour last week on uh, uh, last Sunday in fact as we focused on chapter 8 and 9 talking about how Paul was focused on taking a collection for the church in Jerusalem, a poor church, a persecuted church. And so Paul talks about giving in chapter 8 and chapter 9, and, and uh, we looked at that last uh, Sunday. And then uh, on Thanksgiving Eve, we focused on really just one verse, and that's chapter 9 and verse 15, where the Apostle Paul says, Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Paul is uh, thinking about uh, the gift that God uh, has given in the person of Jesus Christ, our salvation. And uh, he says that's pretty hard to wrap your whole mind and heart around. And so it's an inexpressible gift. And so during uh, this uh, Thanksgiving Christmas season, you might think, well, I don't have a lot to be thankful for. But if you know Jesus, you have the most important thing to be thankful for, and that's your salvation in Jesus Christ. And so we focused on that uh, this uh, past Wednesday. Well, today we're back in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We looked at verses 1 through 11, where the Apostle Paul talks about uh, how uh, there's new clothes that God will give to us, and and, uh, he talks about new bodies that we'll have when we get to heaven. Uh, These bodies uh, will be perfect bodies. There will be no pain, no brokenness. Uh, Our bodies won't uh, have to uh, undergo any kind of uh, suffering anymore. Uh, We won't have any surgeries. We won't worry about going to the doctor and being diagnosed with cancer. We're going to have perfect bodies, uh, and uh, that's what uh, Paul is focused on. But he also wants us to realize in this chapter that talks about a lot of things that are new, that there's a new concern that we ought to have for the future. And so in verses 1 through 11, the Apostle Paul deals with, with really future spiritual realities. And he wants us to know, he tells us this in verse 10 and verse 11, 
that there will be a day when all of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, even as believers, the Bema seat of Christ. And at that uh, judgment seat, you and I will uh, have to give an account of everything we've said and everything that we've done. It will not be a time where we'll be condemned or, or punished because Jesus took our condemnation on himself. But we will stand before God. And uh, we'll either receive, uh, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and receive certain rewards, or they will be taken away from us based on what we've done in our bodies, whether that be good or whether that be bad. He ends verse 10 with that. But then he tells us in verse 11 that we ought to take God seriously when we think about this judgment seat of Christ and so he says in verse 11 therefore knowing the fear of the Lord take God seriously and if you take God seriously then you will pursue others to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior as well well today we're going to focus on verse 12 through uh, verse uh, uh, the end of the chapter verse 21 I'd like to read these verses and then we're going to look at a couple verses as well in uh, the book of Ephesians chapter 2. And so here's what the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. And so Paul is concerned about those who were creating problems at the church at Corinth and those who were false teachers, that their focus was on outward appearance. And uh, what Paul was concerned about is what goes on in the heart. And uh, here were a group of people who were even condemning Paul and saying he's not in his right mind. He's a little crazy. And so Paul deals with that as well in verse uh, 13 uh, when he says, for if we are, are beside ourselves... It is for God. If uh, we are in our right mind, it is for you. And so uh, Paul talks about the fact that he's not going to boast. He's not going to uh, call attention onto himself, but he wanted the people that uh, he cared about at the church at Corinth uh, to uh, understand that he was living for God and living for them as well. Then in verse 14, he says this. He talks about how uh, we ought to be motivated by the love of Almighty God. And he says, for the love of Christ controls us. You might have a translation that says constrains us. I love that word. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But Paul says, for the love of, of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. That means that Christ died for all. Therefore, all have died. If you put your faith and trust in Christ, you've died with him. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who uh, for their sake died and was raised. Then he tells us in verse 16, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Verse 17, you're very familiar with. We, we often quote this verse. Therefore, because of what the Apostle Paul has been teaching thus far, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if he's put their faith and trust in him, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who uh, through Christ reconciled us to himself. And so he begins to... Uh, teach us something that's very, very theological, deeply theological about the issue of reconciliation. And he tells us that, that all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on the behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, 
so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And what a great verse for us today as we think about communion. Now here is a, a chapter that talks about things that are new. We already mentioned that in the first 11 verses, he's talking about new clothing, a new body. He talks about how we ha ought to have a new concern that we need to take God seriously because we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ someday and we're not going to be able to hide. We're, we're not going to be able to fake God out. He's going to know all things and be able to reveal all things and uh, he's going to reward us for those things which are good and uh, we're not going to be rewarded and probably feel pretty bad about it when uh, what's revealed is that we didn't really do what God wanted us to do where we didn't live for God. Maybe that's what uh, John then later talks about, how we're going to uh, uh, have the tears wiped away from our, our eyes. So maybe Paul and others are thinking that, no, it's not just about uh, you know, the, the death of uh, a loved one or, or seeing the hard times people are going through. Maybe it's going to be that when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to feel so bad because of the things that we've done wrong and the things we never did do that God wanted us to do, that God himself, because Jesus took our judgment and our condemnation, will actually wipe the tears away from our eyes. Maybe it's both. But I want you to notice that, that uh, he also talks about this issue of being all things being new uh, in, a, in a few verses. I want to read them in chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians. I'm going to start reading at verse 14. Here's what Paul says. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Do you realize that the relationship that the average person has with God is one of hostility. Uh, it is not peace. It's hostility. And so here's what he has to say. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create him in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit uh, to the Father. And so he talks about this issue of reconciliation. So now back in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I want you to take note of a few things. First of all, in verses 12 and 13, he talks about a new uh, commendation. We've already talked a little bit about these two verses. Uh, Paul's saying that there's no boasting in the flesh. He's not going to boast in the flesh. He's not going to uh, try to convince the church at Corinth that they should trust him because of all of these great and wonderful things. He's not trying to impress them with his past experiences, with his education, with his uh, you know, socioeconomic status, with how he looks etc. And so he, he's focused here on the fact that he lived for God and for the church at Corinth. And so he talks about a new kind of commendation. But then he jumps in in verse 14 and 15 to a new constraint. And there's where he talks about the love of God, verse 14, for the love of Christ controls us or constrains us. And so Paul's talking about what motivates us and what motivated him. Now we could say that maybe in verse 11 that he was somewhat motivated by the fear of, of the Lord and that was not a fear that caused Paul to run away from him but a fear that caused him to take God seriously and to run to God and to do what God wanted him to do. We could also say because throughout this book he's talking about how much he loves the church at Corinth and so maybe he was motivated as well uh, by having just this love and care for the church at Corinth. But here is the peak. Here is what's most important. Paul is letting us know that what has motivated him, what has controlled him, is the love of Almighty God. And so Paul ha has a hard time comprehending, if you will, that great love. A hard time wrapping his mind around that great love. And of course, we know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so Paul's talking about how the love of God, notice he's not saying that it's his love for God that motivates him. It's God's love that motivates Paul to do what God wants him to do. And so what do you think of that love? Well, Paul wants us, I think, to know in all of his writings about love and about God's love, that that love is unending. It never ceases. It's always there. That, that God's love is unselfish, that God is concerned about us. And, and that love that was so unselfish that God the Father sent the Son to this earth to be battered and to be bruised and to, to shed his precious blood and to give his very life to pay for the penalty of my sins and yours. You see, that's an unselfish kind of love. He also wants us to realize that that love is unlimited, for God so loved the world. And so here's this love that God has. It's for all people, those that you and I might think are lovable and those that we might think are unlovable. And so thank God that, that somewhere in there, we're in there. But he also wants us to realize that this love is unconditional, that you never had to worry about winning God's love Therefore, you never have to worry about losing that love. In every other human relationship, we generally try to do something to get people to like us and to love us. And every time we do something, and that's not all wrong, you want to have friends, you got to be friendly, you want to be loved, you need to be somewhat lovable and, and love other people. But realize this, that when you have to win someone's love, you always have, way back in, in your mind, the fear that you could lose that love. But you see, God's love is unconditional. We never had to win his love, therefore we never have to worry about losing that love. It's an unconditional kind of love. And it's unfathomable love. Paul has a difficult time, even though he's the great master in writing about the love of God, he has a hard time fathoming that love. And so he wants us to realize that it is the love of Almighty God that motivates him. Now the word constraint, or in the ESV, control, is an interesting word, and the word itself actually means to hold something together, to press on every side, to hold it fast. So what is Paul telling us? He's saying this, in essence, the love of Christ held him together so that he could finish what God called him to do, regardless of the attacks and the opposition. And so what kept Paul going? The love of Almighty God. And so Paul concluded that his response should be complete surrender and obedience to God. And so there's a new motivation, a new constraint, uh, a new control in our lives. Well, verse 16, he talks about a new consciousness. I love this because it goes so well with the whole concept of reconciliation. But in verse 16, he says this, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. So what is Paul saying here? Well, Paul is saying here is that there's this new consciousness as a believer in Christ. And so Paul looked at God and he looked at people differently now. And so he no longer measured a person's worth and status according to the world's views. And so we need to be careful. Maybe this is what Paul is really emphasizing here, that we need to uh, stop, if you will, stop assessing people according to the world. Well, what does that mean? Well, we, we assess people according to ethnicity and race. We, we assess people according to their culture, to their social status, to their gender, to financial status, to physical appearances, abilities, ancestry, past experiences, whether they're good or bad. And here's what Paul's saying. You know, all of these things divide us. These are the things that we have stereotypes about and biases for. And here's what, what Paul's saying. We need to see God and see people as God sees them. And so there's a new consciousness. Verse 17, he tells us that there's a new creation, that we are all people in Christ, 
uh, all new people in Christ. This is true of our position in Christ, and it's true of our practice as well. And so I, th I think probably the verse, even though we probably misquote it so often, that mainly about our standing before God because of Jesus Christ. And so we're, we're new in our standing before God. Now that kind of goes right into the whole concept then of reconciliation. And so he tells us that there's a new commission here, if you will, verse 18 and 19. And he talks about reconciliation. And so reconciliation concerns our being brought into a harmonious relationship with God himself. So even Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 wants us to realize that there's hostility between us and God uh, because God is perfectly holy and just and righteous and we're sinners. So there's this hostility here. And what Paul is, is emphasizing here that, that we're, we're in this hostile relationship uh, and now because of the gracious love of, of God, we have been reconciled, and what does that mean then? Well, it means that God removed all the barriers between us and him. And so God brought us, and notice that that's the emphasis, that God did it. Notice verse 18, all this is from God. You don't, you, you don't reconcile yourself to God. God reconciles us to himself. And Paul's saying here that God himself has removed the barriers between us and himself. He's brought us from a relationship of rebellion to one of redemption. He's brought us from, from this relationship of hostility and being enemies of God to one that we are now friends with God. Isn't that amazing? And so Paul talks about this in regards to this whole deep, theological concept of, of, uh, of reconciliation. And so he says there, there's now peace in essence, and that peace comes uh, by the blood of, of Jesus Christ. Now there's two aspects to this so that you understand this. The first is the message to proclaim. And so when, when Paul is talking about reconciliation, he's talking about a deep theological message of how, how God uh, brings peace into our relationship and brings us into a, a, a friendship, so to speak, and, and we're no longer enemies because of what Jesus did for us upon the cross of Calvary. So there, there is a message to proclaim, but there's also, I think, and Paul deals with this, I, I think not only in this passage, but other, other, other places, he in essence tells us that there's a model to practice. So a message to proclaim, it's the message of reconciliation. But there's a model that we need to practice as well, that we are reconcilers, that we are, are telling others about the good news that they can be reconciled to God. But we also need to be individuals who are reconciling uh, ourselves to one another, that we're, we're tearing down the bridges that divide us and uh, we're uh, having... Uh, you know, these new bridges built so that we can uh, really be unified and living in peace and harmony. And so he talks about this great concept of reconciliation. And then in verse 20 and 29, or 21 rather, notice uh, he, he tells us, verse 20, therefore. So connected then with this whole ministry of reconciliation that God has reconciled us to himself and that we've been given this ministry of reconciliation, therefore, you have a new career. And the new career is this, that you're an ambassador. I don't know if you've ever spent time with ambassadors. I, I uh, know that uh, uh, Dan Sorber and I have spent time with the ambassador in, the, in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, from Cuba to here, and we've spent a lot of time at the State Department with, with people who have assisted and so forth, the ambassadors, and... And, uh, you know, they, they have very, very important jobs. And so what uh, Paul is telling us here now, and he uses a, this political metaphor, if you will, of an ambassador, that we are ambassadors, not uh, of some country here in the world or some president, but rather of the king of kings and lord of lords. So we are 
his ambassadors. We're an envoy, so to speak, of God to man. We bear the message of God to people here on this earth. Now, I, I'm not, well, I have to say this. I don't really care what you think about um, the impeachment process and whether you sit and watch it or not. I have to admit, I don't watch it. But I'll tell you what, you can learn certain things that regardless of your view can help you even with this. And so one of the things that we've heard a lot about in this impeachment process is that our president, Trump, has, has kind of gotten rid of certain people in the State Department who were ambassadors in some sense. But I want you to realize, and, and this is the truth, regardless of what you, you believe uh, about uh, our government right now and, and about the impeachment process, you have to understand this, that ambassadors are appointed by the president. Now, you can agree with it, disagree with it, but that's the truth. But I want you to know today that scripture tells us that we're ambassadors and we've been appointed by God himself. Argue that one, you say. Well, then you have to understand this too, that an ambassador serves at the pleasure of the president. Guess who we serve at the pleasure of? Not a human government, not a human being, but God himself. And so he tells us that we have this new career. And he ends this chapter in verse 21. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What a great verse to base our, our communion service on today. And so Paul gives us this great understanding of how, uh, you know, Jesus Christ took upon himself our sin. He knew no sin, but took our sin that we today might be, become the righteousness of God that we could not muster up in any way, shape, or form by ourselves. Now, how do we conclude? Well, what, what I would ask this question, first of all, what are you motivated to do, first of all? And what motivates you? I read this week uh, a little story about Frances Ridley Habergale. And you might not know who that is, but uh, she was a well-known hymn writer. And uh, her dad, on one occasion, was having some severe eye trouble, and they were in Germany because uh, for whatever treatment uh, he could only have this treatment in Germany so they were in Germany and they were staying at a pastor's house and she was walking around the house looking at different paintings and she came across the painting of the crucifixion and on the bottom of that picture that painting were these words I did this for thee what has thou done for me? And so she took a piece of paper and wrote a poem. Uh, later, that uh, poem was set to music by Philip Bliss, another well-known American uh, hymn writer. Well, after she wrote the poem, however, she crumbled the paper up and threw the paper into the fireplace and walked away. She didn't like her poem. Her dad, apparently seeing enough, walked by and saw the paper in the fire and grabbed it out before it totally burned. He read it, liked it, and eventually asked his daughter, is it okay if I have this published? And she said yes. What was the song? Here's the song. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou mightest ransom be and quicken from the dead. I gave my life for thee. What has thou given for me? I wonder how Paul would have answered that question. I think Paul would have answered that question this way. I, Lord, I'll, I'll give you everything because everything belongs to you. But the question for us today is this. What are we willing to give? Everything? Ourselves? our time, our talents, our resources. I gave my life for thee. What has thou 
forgiven for me. Let's pray.